The following is a presentation of the Belly Up Sports Media Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of Rising to the Occasion. We're so happy to have you here and be back with you guys. Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, this is the first episode of the new year, I believe, for us. So uh, it's a very exciting time, very new year, and a lot of new things coming. We're going to be kicking out all of the content as much as we possibly can this upcoming year. Uh, it's very exciting looking forward to 2024 and everything that we might uh, be able to be able to do and, and kind of expand and see just where we where we can keep on growing. 2023 was a great year for us and we were able, able to grow a lot with you guys and you guys were a huge part of that. But we're going to get kicked off this year by talking about the college football playoff. There was a lot to get to when we talk about the college football playoff. There's a couple of other games that we're going to touch on as well, uh, especially in that that New Year's Six Bowl games and kind of getting through those. But uh, we're going to start off with the the playoff games themselves because these two games were absolutely uh, they, they were they were absolutely everything that we could have asked for and then some more than I think a lot of us anticipated uh, and they were they were a little bit of a shock too uh, for those who don't know you must have been living under a rock we've got Washington versus Michigan number one against number two two teams were fourteen and zero going against each other and that that's absolutely amazing you couldn't ask for a better national championship lineup than that I know a lot of fans are just happy that you don't have the normal Alabama Georgia uh, kind of matchup or something like that in the national championship game and man it, it, it really did deliver and we're so excited to be able to get into it this year and, and we're going to talk about the national championship game but not today um, but before we get too much further into it uh, we want to first make sure that we mention our sponsor for this this evening I guess this morning for you guys watching but that is Big Frig. Big Frig is absolutely the most amazing product when it comes to coolers and tumblers. You cannot go wrong with your Big Frig coolers and tumblers. Uh, they have some of the, the best things on the market for a fraction of the cost of what the competitors are putting out there. You've got competitors that are charging way too much for their products, but Big Frig has amazing products at a much better price, much more affordable. And the thing is, a lot of times whenever you pay less than maybe your top competitors, uh, then you're just not getting as good of a product. That's definitely not the case when it comes to Big Frig. Big Frig has the best coolers. I know Jeremy and I both love our Badlands coolers, especially that that uh, Badlands camo that you get on the, the coolers. It's very cool looking cooler. Not only that, but it also keeps everything cool exactly as a, a cooler ought to do. It's got an amazing little basket in there that keeps all of your, your papers and things that you don't want to get wet keeps them dry and it's also got a cutting board that also acts as a, as a divider uh, the the screw in plug is another amazing feature to it uh, it's very tough very rigid it's an amazing cooler and of course their their tumblers always do us uh, do us our, our you know our justice and everything that we need them to do so uh, we thank big frig so much for partnering up with up with us and just because they appreciate us mentioning the, them on our show they're going to give our listeners 20 percent off by using code rising 220 so if you go to bigfrig.com, that's B-I-G-F-R-I-G dot com, you can use code R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O-2-0 for 20% off. It's an amazing deal, guys. You do not want to miss out on this deal. So go over to bigfrig.com and use code RISING220 and get yourself an amazing $20 off. But let's go ahead and get into the episode and start to talk about this because we got a lot when it comes to all of these. But first, I'm going to bring in my co-host for the evening. We've got Jeremy joining me virtually. Jeremy, how are we doing, man? Doing pretty good. Had a good day at work today. And then obviously coming home, then always love doing this episode. I mean, obviously, first things first, happy new year to everybody. I hope you guys had a had a great new year, got to celebrate it and really good. But um, going back to the podcast episode we got for you tonight, of course, Josh obviously said we're going to be talking about the playoff reactions. Then there was a lot. Then I was definitely one of those people that I was really excited to not see a Alabama Georgia rematch like we usually have seen in the past. But it's definitely really cool to see other teams shine throughout the year. Then obviously there was a lot of teams that you didn't expect to see in a bowl game. Then obviously made a bowl game, and then they they actually made you uh, really think about your decision obviously looking towards the year and think man they could have never made this position but obviously then going into the bowl games that they proved a lot of people wrong and some of those teams they definitely came up with a dub and like i said they proved a lot of us wrong but josh i know we got a lot to talk about tonight so i'm gonna cut the chit chat and let's get rolling with it 
Yeah, let, let's go ahead and start off with the playoff games. I think that's what's most important, obviously, and the most important games. There are some other fun ones to talk about when we look at these New mm-hmm. Year's Six games. But uh, let's start off with the Rose Bowl that happened first in the evening on Monday. So we're going to start off with uh, the Rose Bowl. You've got Alabama, Michigan. I think everybody on this show, or my, or my, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we all picked, you know, it was, it was a Alabama, Texas is, is how we picked it. And, and so I, I, so. I just I think that was that was just the easy pick. And even though Michigan was the favorite, it didn't feel like that was going to be the case. They were kind of the underdog in the favor of of the nation, I think. Um, but, you know, if, if you're being realistic with the matchup, I think Michigan fans even were very skeptical of whether they'd be able to beat Nick Saban. Uh, and so, you know, seeing that, I, I, I was really shocked to see both of these games really go against a, a lot of, of course, the betting betting odds were for Michigan, but uh, you know, overall, it was kind of going against the narrative that Alabama is just too good. They've gotten better throughout the year, and they're they're going to beat Michigan. I personally thought Mich- Mich- or Alabama would beat Michigan by double digits because they've just looked that good. But I, I think when you dive into this game, uh, first, just start off. Let's let's talk about Michigan because they won the game. Uh, you know, some of the key factors, and I want to far- first start off on the key factors of why Michigan won this game. And I think number one, uh, you were able to capitalize off of mistakes where Alabama wasn't, you know, and so you you made more mistakes as Michigan, but you were able to capitalize off of the mistakes. Uh, and, and whenever Alabama had those mistakes go in their favor, they didn't do the same. And so for Michigan, I think that was one thing. And, uh, and on top of that, too, I just think that overall it felt like they controlled the game very well. It just felt like they were the better team the whole time. Uh, and, and, and how about the, the pass rush, too? Because I think in the first half, if I remember correctly, there was five sacks on 15, uh, 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 what is that called, a drop backs. So five sacks on 15 plays where you drop back for a pass. That's incredible. That's 33% you know, rate of getting back there. Eight, eight, there was eight uh, pressures, QB pressures. So, I mean, you're getting back there just about every single time. Over half the time you're getting back there and you're dropping him for 33% of the time. So, I mean, I thought that was incredible. Uh, looking at that, that that was one thing that I, I took away from this. Uh, but how about you, Jeremy? What, what do you th- what do you think stood out in this game on why Michigan was able to win? The big thing you you took what I was going to say their their defense overall was just the biggest thing that um, that stood out to me. Of course, like you just said, with having that kind of a percentage of drop back and being able to get back to the quarterback on a good quarterback like Jalen Milrow is, we all know he we're used to seeing Jalen Milrow. If he's getting pressured, then he can easily roll out of the pocket, use his legs, or just simply like what we tell a lot of quarterbacks, just throw it away. But in this situation, it just wasn't coming just from one side. It was coming from all sorts of different angles here. And Michigan's defense, they definitely had Jalen Milrow's number. And just even looking at their secondary, like you said, they're able to adjust, and that was a big crucial thing to – to this game for Michigan and looking at it, their secondary, they were definitely strong. They were really good on covers perception. And overall it was just a phenomenal outcome to see Michigan pull off what a lot of people thought that they wouldn't be able to get past Alabama in this situation. I'm not going to lie. I I've said this a lot. I've said this in last year's episodes to where Michigan hasn't played anybody good. And then obviously coming towards when they went and played against Ohio state, then that was the big thing that definitely, shut me up i'm not gonna lie then being able to do what they did against ohio state that was definitely a big accomplishment then just looking throughout what michigan did the entire year it was definitely another big milestone accomplishment and now looking into this college playoff perspective and now getting to play for a national championship this is definitely something that michigan is definitely circling on their calendars and i if i tell you what if michigan plays like they have in the past i I wouldn't be surprised if I see a national championship going to Old Blue down in Michigan. Yeah, I mean, looking at, at, at this Michigan team, too, and the way that they played, you know, you start off the very first play was an interception, uh, mm-hmm. but then they take a better look at the, you know, where, at the play, which hats off, pun, I guess pun uh, not intended, hats off to the referee um, because he yeah. threw his hat down immediately when he noticed. Um, but, you know, the, the referee catching – that he the defender may have had his foot out of bounds before jumping up for that ball. If he would have reestablished him in bounds and then went up and intercepted it, that's an interception. Um, but he didn't realize that he was out of bounds. He jumped from his heel being out of bounds, and therefore it wasn't an interception. So Michigan got really lucky there. Uh, they weren't able to do mm-hmm. much, and it, it felt like 
Alabama was kind of controlling the game, and it felt like the whole game, both teams were just kind of feeling each other out. Uh, I, I, I guess I know you weren't over, but if, if you can remember, uh, you, you weren't over whenever the, the, the main card came on that night. Uh, what was what was the fight that we just now saw? Leon Edwards Leon against Edwards. Uh, Colby Covington. Uh, so it, it, this whole game felt like that. It felt like both both guys kind of trading blows and, and feeling each other out. It never really felt like anyone was throwing a haymaker. It didn't ever feel like anyone actually had complete control of the game. I will say that on that last drive, it felt like, you know, Alabama has like a minute and 15 seconds left or something like that. It felt like they had a chance to get down there, kick a field goal, and win this game, and that's just how it's going to end. That's just the way that that it's going to roll. But that's not what happened. Michigan's defense stood tall, and ultimately you've got to figure out. So I guess I'll jump over to Alabama and why they lost. You, you, first of all, you've got to figure out your snapping. I, I don't know how you've gotten this far into the season and you're still having snaps go past your quarterback and roll at his feet, and he's constantly bending down to pick up the ball. To you know, to to pick up the the, you, the ball needs to be above his waist and and below his head at all times. It it should not miss that torso area at that high of a level, and you're this far into the season. I thought that was very pathetic, but o- overall, the the main reason I think Alabama lost this game was. You saw Alabama revert back to the Alabama that we saw before that LSU game. The Alabama team that was using their their offense in the scheme and, and trying to make Jalen Phil Milrow fill into that scheme and fit into that scheme rather than fitting the scheme to Jalen Milrow. And it just didn't feel like they ran the same type of offense that we've seen from this Alabama team against Georgia, against LSU, mm-hmm. and, and running down the stretch really really ever since that USF game. It felt like they finally started to find their identity, uh, and, and especially in that LSU game. That's when it really clicked, and it was like, you know what? They finally figured it out. They finally pieced it together, and they just reverted. They, they went back to the old Alabama and you know they weren't able to do anything on offense. They had less than 300 yards on offense, which hats off to Michigan's defense. I think they were a big part of it. But Jalen Milrow had no time in the pocket. Uh, he had no time to throw the ball. I, I, I hear a lot of criticism over him. I, I don't think he deserves a lot of criticism. I think he played an okay game. I think he definitely had some mistakes that he could have improved on. But I don't think he played terribly at all and, and I think he's getting a lot of a lot of criticism where it's not due and and then you, you go down to the the last snap to I will defend that last snap you want to put the ball into the your your playmaker's hands and I think Jalen Milrow is the guy that you you can do that I think he just made the wrong read and I, I feel like he was almost diving into the the, the pile and when he could have kind of squ- squeezed it outside so I don't disagree with the last call uh, on that fourth down it does seem like they had the call they wanted. It wasn't going to work out because Michigan calls a timeout. Personally, I would have rather see them go out there since Alabama took a timeout right after Michigan. So Michigan took the timeout. They adjusted def- defensively. Then Alabama realized, oh, crap, they caught on to us. And so then they called a timeout. I wish you would have sent your guys out there. And if you're going to take that timeout anyways, send them out there and try to get the defense to jump. It's not going to get you a first down but it gets you a little bit closer and it makes you a little more comfortable with the play call. So I wish they would have done something instead of just calling a, a timeout right away. Um, but overall, I just feel like Alabama really beat themselves again with low snaps and just a poor, poor uh, offensive play calling. Absolutely. But I mean, I know I, we talked a little bit about the game, of course, in the last play for that. I don't necessarily like, I do agree with you on not giving Jalen Miller a lot of disrespect. Like he played a heck of a game, and you ob- everybody obviously noticed that. But my thing is, I know, like I was just saying, we talked a little bit about this for maybe a possibility of a different read, is instead of punching it up the gut, I know we talked about um, seeing – Milro maybe roll out, not throw it, of course, or maybe do like a, obviously like an RPO play. Then I just didn't necessarily like the fact that he just went straight up for the gut with he, they were on what, like the four, the five yard line or I, I think right the on the three yard line, was. if I remember right. Yeah. Somewhere inside the five, obviously. But I mean, it, of course, you look at that last play, Michigan's defense, obviously they brought everything to the house. Then you obviously saw the left, the right side, excuse me, of Alabama's line breakdown. Then the right tackle obviously got in the back, and then he 
he was the one who tripped up Jalen Milrow to where made him obviously fall short of the touchdown. Then, of course, everything else is just that them from there is history. But I still think that if I was Nick Saban, I I easily would have done like an RPO trick play or something just because I didn't necessarily like the fact that he was just saying just go right up for the gut. But obviously, I know there could have been something that he wanted to try to have Nick Saban and him do. But like you said the best, it was just old Alabama and they're not adjusting to Jalen Monroe's style of play. And it's definitely been something that a lot of teams – are able to um, are able to break down that you can easily see teams come from behind easily to to closely tie the game if not take the advantage away from Alabama and this is definitely something I think in the near future that it definitely needs to be an adjustment to where you need to you need to adjust to your quarterback instead of letting your quarterback adjust to Nick Saban and what he wants to do. But I do have to give some props to Nick Saban during the postgame conference. I can't remember the exact two players that were sitting next to him during the press conference. I would I assume one of, was Jay- yeah, yeah. one of them was Jalen. Yeah, one of them was Jalen and I can't remember who the other one was. But I will give Nick Saban a lot of credit, obviously. A lot of people think that Nick Saban's a hard coach, which don't get me wrong, he could be for all we know. But you got to sure, give yeah. some, yeah, you got to give some respect for for Coach Saban. Then right before the two players got up, he he reached his arms out both the players and said, "Can I say something real quick?" Then saying obviously that these two players and everybody on this team, they all busted their butts this year, and I'm deeply, deeply grateful for them. So. Despite the outcome of the game, I still obviously respect Alabama and for Nick Saban for what he had to say. So props to you, Alabama. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, too, you, you think of Michigan, too, and just what I mean by them capitalizing on mistakes. And, uh, you know, they, they got lucky with some of their mistakes, of course. Oh, definitely. But, you, know, you know, they had the one, the first interception that should have been an interception. Then they mm-hmm. have a, a muffed punt later on. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that, that stunk for them. But then later on, even after that, you have, you have one where I remember he caught it and it was like, man, he almost dropped that. And then he, he had another punt right there at the end of the game when uh, Alabama didn't complete on their, their final drive there. And so uh, Alabama punts it away. It's down on the one yard line and your punt returner goes and tries to, tries to catch it there anyways. And he almost fumbled that. Uh, And so, I mean, that could have turned into a disaster. Just, I, I don't, I don't know what you're thinking in that situation. Um, but yeah, it, it, Michigan needs to figure their, their special teams out for sure. I mm-hmm. think that was definitely a weak point in that game. But let's go over to the other one because you've got Michigan and Washington now uh, over in the other game in, in, in the Sugar Bowl, Washington winning it uh, to, to now go against Michigan in the national championship. But Washington beaten Texas. And if, if you didn't look at uh, – if you didn't watch the game and you're just looking at the score, you're looking at stats – it looks like Washington squeezed out. Even if you just pay attention to, hey, there was a last drive that almost forced, uh, you know, possible overtime or Texas winning it. So, I mean, if, if you look at just the, the paper and you didn't watch the game, it doesn't seem like Washington uh, really won this game too, too confidently. But there really wasn't a moment in the game where it felt like, oh, Texas is coming back. Tex- Texas is going to do it. Other than that last drive, you really didn't feel that the whole way through. It just felt like Washington could have won this game by 50 if they really wanted to. I mean, they, they ran the ball a lot. They controlled the, the ball. Uh, and, and you know, they just did what they had to do. And, and I don't I don't feel like it was – I think that was just part of their game plan. Hey, we don't, need to, we don't want to, we need to win by 20 points. We don't need to win by 10 points. We just need to win by one. And that was their mentality coming into it. They ended up winning 37 to 31. But Michael Penix Jr. proves why he should have been the, the Heisman winner. Uh, and and I, th- I think that's that's evident in this game. He had like 430 yards and two touchdowns. And if you watch his throws. So I, I think there was only one throw that I can remember. And I know it's been a couple of days. So maybe I'm just forgetting uh, a couple of them that were like, ooh, that was he got away with one. But there was only one throw that I thought, ooh, that wasn't very good. And it was really like, ah, that it wasn't a very good pass. But it was also a pass that was kind of away from a defender. So I understood why he threw it where he threw it. So. Mm-hmm. Every every throw that he makes, man, he's just got a cannon, and he doesn't put any effort into his throws. It, it just looks like he's just throwing it as if I would toss a paper into into a trash can. That that's what it looks like for him and his effort throwing the ball. 
I wonder what it would look like if he actually put effort into throwing it and trying to launch it. Because I don't I think I don't think the stadium would, would be able to hold the ball. <laughs> I just I, I don't know. This this dude is absolutely phenomenal. Possibly the best quarterback play in a single game that I may have seen since Oklahoma, Texas Tech back when Baker Mayfield and Patrick Mahomes were going at it. Uh, and, and I was going to say ever, but then I remembered that game. So, I mean, just these two quarterbacks both playing a very good game. Again, another one where if you look at the just the stats, Quinn Ewers didn't have the greatest percentage, so you're thinking, oh, he didn't have a good game. I don't think he had a bad game. I think the defense really shut down, shut him down. The defense was playing very tight coverage the whole 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 way through. Uh, Texas had some dropped passes quite a bit in there. Uh, and so just overall, I, this was an amazing quarterback play. But let's start off with Washington and, again, kind of go in the same order, why Washington won the game. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you kind of start us off with this, but why, why do you think Washington was able to pull out the W? The reason why Washington was able to pull out the W is more heart and just being able to play and just the style of how they do it. Like, first things first, obviously going off of what you just said a little bit about Michael Penix Jr., if I were to try and throw just a, qu- a quarter of how he throws, I guarantee you my shoulder would be thrown out of socket. But literally, Michael Penix Jr. makes it literally look so effortless to throw a 65-yard-plus bomb on a dime. And it doesn't even need to be a 65-yard bomb. It can just literally be a 10, 15, 15-yard 15 post route or or a quick slant route, and it just literally looks like it's nothing. And there was a lot of throws that – I shouldn't say a lot. There was a few at least that I saw – and with how tight that Texas's defense was covering the wide receivers, I thought that a couple of the throws along the sideline, I'm thinking he shouldn't have thrown that because I was thinking that, excuse me, it could easily get picked off or it could easily get batted out of the air for an incomplete pass. It literally looked like some of the passes that he was throwing along the sidelines to his wide receivers, it literally looked like it maybe missed the defender's shoulder by maybe about two inches. And it still just falls right into the bread basket. I sincerely don't know how – you can do that. It just goes to show you how much practice and time that they put in for for just being able to throw on that kind of a shot. But for the overall perspective for why Washington won, like I said, it was hard. I know, you, like you said, they didn't need to win by 20. They easily could have or way more than 20. It, it but feels they like just, they could have. Oh, easily. And I mean, it just seemed like that Washington was just easily – controlling the game for both on the offensive side and the defensive side of the ball. Their middle linebackers, they were definitely reading the reads right. They were following their blocks, and they were just – they weren't afraid to stick their nose into something. And overall for Washington, it was definitely a situation to where you look, okay, you see Texas. They just ran down the field and just scored a touchdown. We're down by seven. A lot of teams you can easily see in that kind of a situation, they'll they'll tend to get nervous – and they start making little mental errors and mental mistakes, then they could easily throw a pick or fumble the ball or whatever the situation is. No, Washington, they didn't even look at that aspect. They just kept sticking to their game plan, and they just wanted to all, overall ball out and play for a national championship. So my big thing is, like I said, it's the, it's the heart of Washington that truly won this game, and it really goes to show you how much that they wanted. But my thing is, going into the national championship against Michigan, I sincerely don't think that you see that same aspect like you just played against um, against Texas. I think this is that moment in time for a championship, obviously on the line, that you have to go all above, not just not just put the cruise on the gas pill and just try and squeeze by. This is definitely a time to where you have to just put your foot to the floor and just lay everything out on the line for that national championship. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I think they had more heart. I think, uh, obviously, like I said, too, I think just my, Michael Penix was just a, a game changer in this game. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one thing, one thing that really both teams on defense did really well on uh, was just overall third down, effi- you know, efficiency. efficiency. The, the defense yeah. were was able to hold them out a lot. I think Washington went three of eleven, and Texas went four of eleven on third downs. So I mean, just that alone, it, that's. That just shows how tough that defense was. You you can't get yourself into a third down situation, um, but a lot of that uh, was, you know, certain certain third downs that was was just too long, or uh, you know, the, there was a, a lot of them too where I thought Washington might go for it on fourth down, and they didn't. I think they were just kind of playing smart, playing to win, and 
again, I think that just plays into their 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 uh, game plan. But uh, just overall, Washington was just lighting them up, uh, and they mixed in the run really well. They didn't they didn't run the ball a ton. Uh, they I think they only had just over a hundred yards of rushing, but they were able to to mix in that run just enough to keep that passing game open. And Texas mm-hmm. could not stop Michael Penix and these. I mean, how do you? We were talking about this. They've got four solid receivers out there. I mean, especially when you talk about McMillan and Roma Dunze, uh, and and you can you can use Dylan Johnson out of the backfield, uh, you know. And, and then of course you've got Culp in there as, as your tight end. I mean, just they've got weapons all around. And then Michael the Penix has he's he's shown you too that he can use his legs, and he used his legs a few times in this game. Uh, so I mean, just looking at him. I don't I don't know what you're supposed to do to slow down this Washington offense and that's one thing I think looking forward uh, you're gonna have a really hard time because I mean when 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 Michael Penix runs I'm I'm pretty sure he only ran three plays but he had over 30 yards Mm -hmm. so I mean just just thinking about thinking about what he can do and and that's something that he's kept close to his chest all year long but teams, especially when you talk about Michigan going into the national championship, you've got to have that in your head a little bit. But on top of that, just looking overall, Michael Penix has only been sacked 11 times all season long. Man. 11 times all season long. Uh, I, I saw a stat, or I, I heard of a stat, and I don't know if it's completely true, but I heard that Michael Penix has been sacked less in his entire career, which I'm pretty sure he's either fifth or sixth year senior right now, at least fifth. And so with Michael Penix has been sacked less in his entire year than Caleb Williams was this past season alone. That's, that's just crazy to me. And it's all, it's all because look at the pressure that Texas had. Uh, and, and, and I think this is why Washington won was because Michael Penix was obviously the difference maker, but it's because they would not allow allow a sack, and Michael Penix would not allow a sack. Texas got a bunch of pressure back to him, but you mm-hmm. see him slip up in the pocket and make the throw, or they're right in his face, and he flips the ball out, like I said, with no effort at all, and and makes the makes the play. It's just incredible. But jumping over to Texas, I think Texas lost a, a little bit. You know, of course, I think just the fact that you couldn't stop their offense, I guess that's that's kind of the big reason, but. Ultimately, I feel like it was just all penalties. Uh, they had, I think, mm-hmm. 66 yards, if I remember right, 66 yards of penalties. Close to 70. Yeah, I mean, just terrible, terrible. And and, and they were they were getting called for really dumb penalties that you've got to have a, a you know, just a better sense, of, you know, a, 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 upon you uh, to know. And it, you you've got to you you have got to win that. And of course, I think the turnovers play into it too. They they lost the turnover battle, uh, and so I mean, just looking at Texas overall. They, they they didn't control any aspect of the game. Uh, time of possession went to went to Washington by, I know it was over ten minutes uh, over mm-hmm. to Washington. So I mean, just I think uh, you know Texas they they've got to be m- more mentally prepared than they were in this game, and I just don't think they had it. But uh, what about you? What what do you think Texas? How do you think Texas lost this game? You said it, and I was just going to list the exact same thing off as penalties. Just. If you get yourself into penalty trouble, which I've said to everybody in the past, it's so hard to get out of that rhythm. And the to me, it just seemed like their offense, at times, it seemed like they're they're here for the game-winning drive. And at other times, it just seems like their offense is just out there for another series and just to go three and out and just punt the ball away to Washington. Now, I will give Texas some credit at – Closer towards the end of the game, obviously, they had the big plays going down the end zone. Then um, I can't remember the wide receiver. I think it's Williams who caught the um, the corner pass to where it looked like he jumped too early. And me and your me and your dad were obviously saying he he jumped way too early. Then all of a sudden he went up and high pointed and then caught it like it was nothing. I'm like, wow, that was truly unbelievable. But at the same time, it's cool to see. Um, it's cool to see plays like that, but you look at the play prior to that one, and he was expecting, or at least he was thinking, that he was going to get the ball on that play. Then he turned right to the Texas sideline and said, come on, give me a chance. And the next play, obviously, like I say, he goes up high points and gets a touchdown for Texas. But my thing is, 
if you have one player that just obviously wants the ball, it's great, but you need to have a whole team that wants that same mentality and get the ball in your hands and try and put the ball into the end zone. Now, and obviously their offense for Texas, they did a they did a fairly okay job, but of course when it came to the time to where you see Michael Penix Jr. roll out and use his legs, you couldn't stop him. And it was definitely something to where Texas, I do give you guys some credit, but you just simply got outplayed by Washington. And now we obviously see them going for a national championship. And this is definitely going to be a fun one to watch. Yeah, it is. It's, it's going to be really fun. Yeah. And I think you're thinking of, uh, Oh, now I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Adonai Mitchell. Uh, yeah, was, Adonai was, Mitchell, yeah. not Williams. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, because he he yeah he he kind of threw his little little fit and got got exactly yeah. what he wanted. And I think yeah. he might have been the one that they tried going to there at the end of the game too, uh, to try yeah, to get I him think the ball, it was. and just couldn't quite get it to him. Uh, and and just a, an outstanding play to, by the defender there too, and, and swatting mm-hmm. the ball away, perfect timing, knowing mm-hmm. your role and knowing that the ball is probably coming towards the guy that you're covering because they're going to give their playmakers the ball. Your, your guy has a high chance. If, if you're, if you're guarding out and I Mitchell um, be ready. And there's only one second left on the clock. Uh, and another thing hats off to the refs for, for, I mean, really on both games, I felt like the refs did a very good job overall. Yeah. Uh, although I felt, I did feel like Michigan got away with a lot of big time holding plays. Um, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna blame the rest too much for that. There's holding on every every uh, every play, so you can't really get too mad. Exactly. But uh, yeah, I mean it's it's gonna be really fun. I'm very excited for this upcoming Monday. Uh, and we're gonna have to you know I mean just get ready. I already took Tuesday off because I knew I was gonna be <laughs> up and just you know it's it's so hard coming into work the next day. I think Tuesday this week, man, like that was that was tough too because I had to get up early and hit the road and drive eight hours for work so that wasn't fun at all but let's jump over to talking about another game that happened on Monday Oregon Liberty Uh, this was a just a game that I was looking forward to mainly because you know we we figured Liberty probably doesn't stand much of a chance and I think I think Liberty came into this with a lot of high hopes but then you find out that guys like Bo Nix and Bucky Irving and, you know, just a, a list of other other veteran guys. Uh, their, their wide receiver, too. I can't think of his first name, Johnson. Uh, he had an absolute game. Uh, so, mm-hmm. I mean, just looking looking at Oregon, I, I mean, the fact that these guys came back to finish this game off, that means so much for, for, the, for the sport and for Oregon. And, and especially going into next year, you're going to be going into the Big Ten – end this season on a high note and they did they got to 12 wins with this win and they won in a great fashion winning 45 to 6 uh over there and uh that was the fiesta bowl so i mean i wanted to call it the tostitos fiesta bowl but it's called the uh verbo verbo fiesta bowl now and so i I don't even i don't even know what verbo is 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 that the airbnb kind of thing that's what i'm assuming i have no idea yeah i I think that's what it is but you know just i I miss it being the tostitos fiesta bowl because that just made more sense but I'm I'm really happy of, of, that these guys came in. Bonix had a day through for 363 yards and five touchdowns, no turnovers on the day. So I mean, just an an amazing day. And then that that his receiver Johnson too, 170 some yards from him and a touchdown. And then Bucky Irving had an, a, a buck 17. So I mean, just the the whole offense, all these all these guys that came in. Uh, you know, there was one thing that they had in mind, and and they got it done. Uh, so just looking at at Oregon, I'm, I'm very proud of of them and the, and the team and and the the this deciding to come back into this uh, game. You know, I think this was really big because it, it really doesn't mean much, especially when you're going against them. And they were very disciplined too. Only two penalties on the day for 10 yards. That was it. Uh, and then they also obviously controlled. Uh, and and then they also won the turnover battle. So I mean, there was just really every aspect of the game went in their favor. I mean, they they killed. Liberty in every aspect of the game, and it, they 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 shut them down too offensively. They couldn't do anything, and and let's not let's not forget this was a Liberty offense that's very good. Their defense isn't great, and so letting up forty five that's that's understandable to Oregon, uh, but you held a, the Oregon held a Liberty offense who was very good throughout the season to less than three hundred yards total and only six points, no 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 end zone trips for this team. So I, I think I'm, I'm just I'm just really proud of Oregon and, and what they were able to put together and I'm I'm excited for them going to the into the Big Ten. 
Absolutely. For um, for Oregon going to the Big Ten, this is definitely going to be a good a good um, a good stopping point from where they're currently at. Obviously, in the Pac-12, then now going into the Big Ten, this is definitely going to be a big thing. And uh, the answer to your question, Josh, it's Tez Johnson because I had to look it up because it was driving Tez me nuts Johnson. too. Okay. Yeah, then, yeah um, I, I knew I, I knew as soon as you said it, it was going to ring a bell too. And yeah, I exactly. Couldn't, I couldn't think like, man, what is his first name? It's Johnson. Yeah, the it was driving me nuts, so I had to look it up really quick because I knew if I didn't, it was going to bug me. But um, I believe yeah. he's another guy too that that decided not to opt out, so he opted out of opting out. Yeah, so, absolutely. You know, great, great, you know, great decision, and that's what the sport needs. Absolutely. I mean, you see some of these players like um, like Marvin Harrison Jr. who opted out. Then um, is there's there's obviously other players that did the same thing and opt out. Then this is definitely one team for Oregon. I. I've always liked Oregon, not just because of the monumental outfit changes that they always do every year is what it seems like. But this, especially this year's team, there was no op outs for Oregon. And it just goes to show you how much that these guys, they all wanted to have that final game together as brothers and a brotherhood that they want to end all together. And like you obviously said, for Oregon and their offense and just absolutely just laying everything out there and just being dominant and just playing up the stores that they did. I mean, like you said, Liberty, they're, they're a good team at times, but I mean, I mean it, they went 13 and Oh, they won their conference. I mean, they're, they're definitely a good team. I think this being their first power five uh, conference, you know, the it's power a five curve. team. Yeah. I, 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 I don't think anybody expected them to win or really put up yeah. a, a big fight or anything. It's just, uh, it, it sucks that you got put into that place. I wish they could have been, in a bowl game where they actually matched up just because I think they deserved that. But uh, yeah. you're a 13 and 0 and you got yourself to a big stage. I think that's deserving, uh, oh, you yeah. know, of, of a round of applause, at least for that, you know? So I just, uh, they, they had a good season and, and I, I hate that, that it had to end this way, but I love that it ended this way for Oregon. To me, that's definitely a win in my book for Liberty, though. I mean, for Oregon to end the way that you guys did, and like I said, to have everybody come back and just play your one last final hurrah before you see some of these guys obviously go to the NFL draft. And then obviously for those people that are going to the NFL draft, I wish you guys obviously nothing but the best and stay healthy and stay positive, keep a good mindset. But, I mean, for these guys that are going to be returning next year, of course, you look at this – you look at this group that was just recently here, and now you obviously want to try and follow in their footsteps and go on that positivity reign and just keep keep the keep the ball rolling. And you definitely, obviously, have a lot to go to, especially like it's it's one thing to lose like Bo Nix, Tez, Tez Johnson, and I mean that's one thing, but now completely jumping to a different division, obviously that's going to be the next big thing for a lot of these teams that are making that transition to different conferences. So like you see some of these teams that we obviously dominate certain divisions and now they do, they're doing this move. It's definitely going to be a learning curve for some of these teams. Some of them are definitely going to get an eye awakener. And some of these teams, I think like they're just going to, they're going to act like they never left. They just, they just, got in and then they just kept the ball rolling but obviously that's going to be a fun time for when we see that outcome happen so looking forward to the future it's definitely gonna be exciting for college football yeah absolutely and I, 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 like i said too i'm just I'm, I'm i'm very i'm very proud of this team and dan landing i think he's got a good program there um but you know and, and it's it it kicks off into the new year with all these games that were happening uh, it kicks this new year off really well. And before we get too much further as well, we better talk about how we have to get started on our resolution. And that's mm -hmm. where Factor Meals comes into play. Uh, get started with your resolutions with Factor so you're ready for the new year. Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in this new year. Skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian-approved meals delivered right to your door. That's right. They are delivered to your door. No effort in having to go to the store and do all that fun stuff. Uh, you know, just you get it right to you. It's amazing, guys. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto or calorie smart, vegan plus uh, you know plus some veggie options and more plus 
over 55 weekly add-ons. That's right. They add on more every <laughs> week. So you'll have to check them out. You'll, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your New Year resolutions. Factor now also offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, and more to keep you going no matter what is on the schedule. Uh, I, I had one of my smoothies right on air to give a, 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 a kind of a review right as I was drinking it. And I thought, well, let me test this out. This is the first time trying it. So this is kind of risky. It was the tropical fruit smoothie. It became my favorite smoothie that I've tried out of their package. They sent us a huge bundle of stuff to try out and I absolutely loved it all. All of the meals have, have been phenomenal. There hasn't been anything that I just didn't like. Uh, and, and not only that, but if you're a picky eater, you can search through their meals and see what they have in them and, and you can you can choose. And they're all, they, they really do taste like gourmet meals. They're, they really are, they're, they're chef prepared meals. Uh, and there's, there's so many amazing things that, you know, there's all kinds of stress that goes into meal planning and into prepping and cooking. You have to make sure that you've got enough time when you get home in the evening cut down that time because factor meals are amazing not only do they take away having to go to the store and get the food to to prepare it and get all of that and then of course the time that it takes to cook factor only takes two minutes in the microwave or seven minutes in the the oven so if you want to cook it in the oven that is a, the better way to do it. it takes seven minutes less than 10 minutes and your food is ready and there is no effort at all if you pop it in the oven all you have to do is tear that film off of the package pop it on a, on a, you know, put it on a tray and, and pop it in the oven, you're good to go. It's, it's so easy guys. And it really does take all of the stress away. You can stress less over meal times in the new year factors, no prep, no mess meals. Uh, they free up so much time otherwise spent on shopping and cooking and cleaning up. No more wasting time in the kitchen. Use factor. You need to head to factor meals dot com slash rising 250 and use code rising 250 and get yourself 50 percent off that's right this isn't just a, a crazy little deal where we give you 10 15 20 percent off you're getting 50 percent off that's code rising two at factormeals.com that's code r-i-s-i-n-g-t-o five zero for 50 percent off at factormeals.com slash R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O-5-0. Get yourself 50% off at Factor Meals. Guys, I, I promise this is a, a deal of a lifetime and one that you will not want to miss. But let's get back into the action, Jeremy. Let's talk about another game that happened this past weekend that was Ole Miss Penn State on Saturday morning. This was a really fun game, and I was really excited to watch it. It started off a little rough, so Ole Miss gets down there. Uh, they're about to they're, they're in scoring position. There's an offsides. They heave the ball up, score a touchdown, but no, it's getting called back because of the offsides. They said they they blew the, the play dead. Wrong call. I don't understand how you do that. There was no encroachment. They called it offsides for the guy jumping across. Very next play, another offsides, but they don't call that one. That one's incomplete. Now they have to kick a field goal when the refs missed an offside that could have helped them. Uh, so, I mean, just this this one started off rough for Ole Miss. I think it just added a fuel to the fire, though. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, just seeing this, you know, even though that Chop Robinson and a couple of other guys were gone, Penn State was still getting some pressure back on Jackson Dart. Uh, so Ole Miss wins this game 38-25, to but Jackson Dart, uh, he threw for almost 380 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, he had a very good game. And then Quentin Judkins, the dude is an animal. Both of these guys are coming back. You've got Jackson Dart on the best season he's had yet. And I believe, if I remember correctly, he only threw five interceptions this year. He has improved tremendously. And this game, I think, was a, a jump start and, and put him in. I think it really boosted his, his momentum. I think it boosted his morale. Uh, so you've got Jackson Dart and, and Quint, Quentin Jud Judkins both coming back. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely excited for this Ole Miss team. And knowing how they attack the transfer portal – this is going to be a very dangerous team looking forward, uh, you know, and, and you know, just over on the other side, I just don't think Penn State outside of the first few drives, uh, you know, I think in the second quarter, it seemed like Penn State was getting something together. But outside of that, it, it just felt like Ole Miss was controlling the game the whole way through. They were the aggressors and, and ultimately they ended up winning this game and it was a really good game uh, getting them to 11 wins. That's a huge momentum, uh, you know, piece to put, it, it, with, your, with your program, uh, I think Lane Kiffin's got some good things working over there in Ole Miss. 
Absolutely. I mean, you said I, I was just going to actually talk about that. If I have something that would mind boggle me is those two offside offside penalties that that to me was absolutely bogus. And it definitely should have been fair to both of those ob- obvious calls that one shouldn't have even happened. Then, of course, the other one that did happen that didn't happen. That definitely it was definitely upsetting to me. And it's not how you want to see a bowl game uh, get officiated. But um, that's besides the point. But I mean, Ole Miss, they definitely did come out with a vengeance after having those two unfortunate things occur. And for the overall game, I think they had like 530, 540 yards for the whole game. That's, excuse me, that's definitely something that is huge for a team like Ole Miss. And like you said, getting Jackson Dart back next year, who, in my opinion, this is obviously the best that he's played in his college career. And for how they attack the transfer portal, like you said, Josh, they're definitely going to be a team that I would sincerely watch out for. I know, obviously, there's a lot of people that talk about Ole Miss and say, oh, this is just another team that we can easily come through and just com- come into their stadium or on the road that we can control this team. You you, you really be surprised for what you see out of Ole Miss. I mean, they may not, they may not look like the team that – can absolutely knock the doors off of you guys. But, I mean, they're definitely not going to go down without a fight. And Ole Miss, they're definitely a team that I've always I've always kept tabs on Ole Miss just because I have a lot of family that likes Ole Miss, and I have a lot of friends in the same situation that like Ole Miss, and they always ask me about some of the, some of the things that go on with Ole Miss. But looking at this statistic, it's definitely going to be – an upcoming year, I would definitely say for Ole Miss after this bowl game and obviously ending on a high note, winning 38-25, to 25, it's definitely going to be something to where next year you better watch out for Ole Miss because I think next year Ole Miss, I think they're definitely going to be one of those, I wouldn't say top four teams that can make a college, cha- I mean, make it to the college championship, but they're definitely not going to go down without a fight to definitely try and get well, into that I, I think if they – if they play like they did this year, and then on top of that, adding, uh, you know, the, your your quarterback and your running back back in, in, onto your team next year, uh, you mm-hmm. know, so you're going to have a little bit more of a veteran type team, and then on top of that, you're going to be able to add more guys in. You still have time to add guys from the transfer portal, uh, which is where Lane Kiffin likes to attack. So, you mm-hmm. know, just looking at this team, I do think that they could possibly be a top twelve team next year and make that playoff next year because remember next year is going to be that 12 team playoff i think that's exciting to look at especially for teams like ole miss but Mm -hmm. uh you know i just i i I was very shocked at how well jackson darnold uh, sorry not jackson uh, jackson uh, Jackson Jackson dart Dart. uh how how well he played uh he he played really well the entire season and it was one of those things where you know we, we we know him to make those throws that he shouldn't make and that's what he's known for in the last few years. And I, I personally was not impressed with Ole Miss all season long. And I just felt like, yeah, they're winning this game, but I'm just not impressed. But I'm very I'm mm-hmm. impressed with how they played against Penn State. I think they played very well. And I'm very impressed of, of how they look going forward. Uh, and I, I think th- I think they'll start to turn heads a little more next year. I think they they win a couple of games that they shouldn't next year. Uh I'm not going to call it against my Sooners, but maybe you win one like the Sooners where you probably shouldn't win that game, but you come out and win it anyways. So just games like that. And I think their schedule next year lines up to be a pretty easy one. Uh, I remember looking at their schedule and it's not an easy one, but easier than it could be uh, compared to teams like Oklahoma uh, or LSU. Florida has a a brutal schedule, I believe, next year. So, uh, you know, there's there's some teams out there that have have a pretty tough schedule. Ole Miss is definitely not one of them. So I think it's it's favorable. But let's go to another one that happened on Saturday, uh, one that I talked about, and I called it exactly how it was, really. I mean, it was more of a bloodbath than I imagined it would be. But Georgia, Florida State, and like I said, too, man, it's just this was the moment for Florida State to prove the committee wrong. (laughs) <laughs> and instead, I mean, they, they didn't prove the committee right. And so, I, again, I, I think I mentioned something on Saturday about this. You're going to have people say, see, Florida State didn't deserve to be in. The committee was right. They should have never put them in. You even have – I know you have people saying, see, Georgia should have been in the top four. No, that's not what this means. Georgia played a very good game. Really, Georgia played an extremely good second quarter if you watched yeah. that game. 
<laughs> but really, really, they played a phenomenal game against a B team, against a backup team, against the practice squad, basically. I mean, mm-hmm. you had second and third string guys playing the entire game. That's that's what you had. And so, yes, you should be okay, and you should be better uh, if you have one or two guys out. But they had almost every single Let's starter gone. All right, and so th- this was a pathetic game from Florida State. I'm I'm on the side where I, th- I think Jake Crane even said it too, and I, w- I agreed with him. Uh, but if if you're not going to, it, I think the entire team should have protested and just said we're not playing a bowl game at all. Especially after I mean after you find out if if you find out within like we have guys that don't want to play. Hey, you know what, guys, don't make that decision yet. Let's talk about this as a team, and then you elect as a team. I would respect that decision because I do think you got robbed out of what was what you should have been given. I do think they, I I I know it sucks. I I, I don't think, I don't think they were one of the four best teams, but they did what they had to do, and they they won throughout the season. How do they not get into the playoffs? If you're if you're Florida State, you're pissed off, and you just say no, we're not, we're, we're we just refuse, we refuse to play because. You're going to keep us out after we've done everything. We have been undefeated, and you you, you go on the road to the swamp with your third string quarter, or you know your second string quarterback, and win. Then you beat Louisville in the ACC championship game with your third string quarterback. And what else do you have to prove? You don't have anything else to prove. You opt out of that game. Instead, the you had certain guys opt out, and Florida State still went through with it. Uh, it was a pathetic showing, uh, and. I, I like I said, I just wish Florida State would have just opted to completely skip the game. This is definitely one of those games to where I sincerely think Florida State was wishing that there was a mercy involved <laughs> in the situation. I mean, I, I'm just going to read you guys off some of the stats for for the overall game. For total yards, Florida State had 209 yards. Georgia had 673 yards on the game. Then pass yards, obviously, I know this accumulates into the total yards. That Florida State had 146, and Georgia had 301. For rushing yards, Florida State, 63 total yards on the game. Georgia, on the other hand, almost had 400. They had 372 yards on the game. And the last big stat that I want to I want to tell you guys for the average yards per play, Florida State had three point nine yards, and Georgia had eight point nine yards averaging. This is definitely something to where you're playing a national championship team against the against the freshman, and this is definitely a game. I kid you not. I didn't watch. I watched maybe the maybe the first two quarters. At, at the most, absolutely. Then I knew it was just going to only get worse and worse from here, so I didn't even watch the rest of the game. Now, for Florida State, like you obviously said, you have who? Nobody that we're used to usually seeing on, on for their starters or whatever the situation is. This is definitely a game Florida, fan, Florida State fans and – a lot of people on that Florida State roster wish that they could just they could have been there, or they just didn't sincerely want to have the game even go down. Just because if I was one of those Florida State players, I, I I would agree with you, Josh. I wish I would have had a had like a committee and just simply just say, hey, this is nothing like what we've obviously had this entire year. We've lost majority of the whole the whole starting starting roster for all of us. I don't think it's necessarily going to be – if it's necessarily going to be right or even just necessarily fair that we just throw these guys out there who probably haven't had a whole bunch of reps or just a whole bunch of time even seeing the field realistically and just put them out there and just let the let the dogs on them. And I, I, I sincerely felt bad for Florida State just because – you look at Florida State, obviously, at the beginning of the year and going through the middle of the season, obviously, with Jordan Travis and a lot of their star key players, they're putting up great numbers, great games, and pulling off dubs. And, of course, obviously, they, they didn't go perfect. They they obviously had some losses, but 
Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Josh. They finally didn't get their first loss until Jordan Travis got injured, correct? Yeah, well, this was their first loss. Oh, really? I thought they had yeah. I thought they no, had no, at least two losses. That's, that's why that's why they deserve to be in the national championship or in, in the okay. in the uh, the playoffs because they were undefeated. Yeah. They win their their championship game. They're undefeated. And you put yeah, two sure. two one loss teams above them. What that tells me is that these two teams one loss was more valuable to their team mm-hmm. than Florida State's no losses. I mean, yeah. I understand the, the decision, and I do feel like the committee got it right in a sense. And we talked about this. We went we yeah. went into depth about this. I don't disagree with the committee and why they chose the teams that they did. I do think the the standings were a little silly. Why did you bump Georgia down to number six? I, I, that that doesn't make any sense to me. Why did you put Florida State above yeah. above Georgia? Uh, yeah, it just I I didn't understand it. I mean, obviously, like we said, the only real real way to make this right was to put all six teams in there um but i I don't know i mean it it was a pathetic showing and and it it was what we expected like i said the only way that florida state wins is by not playing just don't Mm -hmm. play the game i I, i'm I'm sincere when i say that too what are they gonna do about it if you just say no we're not playing they can't do anything so just just don't do it just just don't play the game because now you embarrassed yourself Uh, and, and all all the narrative around this too there is nothing you can learn from this game. It doesn't. It doesn't prove one thing or another about the committee or uh, the decision on the playoffs. Nothing. None of that. Um, but let's go over to another game and we'll wrap it up with this one. One that you and I were were looking forward to talking about. It was the offense not showing up again for Iowa. Uh, if you looked at this game, I, I mean, I expected Iowa uh, to do exactly what they did against Tennessee, get blown out uh, and not score a single touchdown. I was thinking more like maybe 24 to zero, but instead 35 to zero, Tennessee whoops up on them. Uh, This does say quite a bit about Tennessee because Iowa does have a good defense. We know that we're not going to sit here and, you know, argue or ignore the fact that they have a good defense, but Iowa has the most pathetic offense, the worst offense in all of college football out of 130 teams ranked 130 at the total offense. Out of 130 teams, they're ranked number thir- 130 for total total you know points for and, t- and touchdowns. I mean, they are absolutely terrible. Uh, so I mean, just you can't put up any points on offense against Tennessee, who doesn't have a good defense. But one thing I want to take away from Tennessee: you found the quarterback of your future, because that Nico, however you say his last name, dude, that dude Nico needs to be the guy. I don't know why he didn't come in earlier in the season, but this was like a a perfect game to put him in. He kind of got his feet wet in college football now on a big stage, and he, let, let's not forget he went against a pretty good a pretty good defense. Went twelve and yeah. nineteen, one hundred and fifty one yards. I mean his his stats weren't great, but the way he played, he was very good. Three rushing touchdowns, uh, not not any of them too, super long or anything, but uh, he he looked phenomenal. I thought. And, and there's a lot of room for improvement too, and and again, like I said, he went against a very tough defense. So I, yeah, Nico, that was that was the bright and shining light to me whenever I saw this. Um, but I just I wanted to pull up the team stats too to look at this. So you you had uh, Iowa, uh, they had 173 total yards, 60 passing yards, 60 passing yards. You couldn't break 100 in passing yards against Tennessee, who does not have a secondary. It's not like you went against a really tough defense or anything. Um, but then you had uh, two, uh, two interceptions and a fumble, so you got just obliterated in the, in the, the turnover battle, 3-0. to zero. Uh, You couldn't even control the ball. Uh, you, you lost, you lost the, the time of possession game, too, by, by three minutes almost. I just pathetic showing by Iowa, and I don't know how the heck they got 10 wins this year. Uh, you know, just but they, they were terrible. Uh, and I I think I saw something. Let me see if I if I saved it real quick too. And just just because I I thought it was funny, uh, and, and I wanted I wanted to keep track of it. I don't think I did. Uh, I believe I believe it was ninety three to zero. You you showed it to me, didn't you? 
Yep. Uh, and, and so I was going to talk about that. 93 to zero against AP ranked teams. That's how mm-hmm. terrible Iowa is. And I don't want to hear it from their fans about how great their punter is. That's not an accomplishment. <laughs> That's not an accomplishment. Oh. Your punter's good because you suck. Your team <laughs> sucks. Your offense sucks. I, I think you Iowa fans better. are, I think Iowa fans are the most annoying college football fans on the planet this year. For that reason, our punter is better than yours because he broke a record for most punting yards. That means your offense sucks. Sucks. <laughs> wow. Just pathetic. Uh, Iowa, you didn't deserve the Big Ten championship game. You didn't deserve a big bowl like Shot. the Citrus Bowl. Uh, you didn't deserve to go against uh, Tennessee, and you didn't deserve to be in the top 25 regardless of your record, your cupcake record. Take it and go home and figure out your offense. You feel better? No. <laughs> no. Oh, they just man, they just but... wasted that much time of my life having to, to ridicule them for sucking. <laughs> I know, but I'm going to say this just because there's that one person that we all know who got me hooked on saying this catchphrase at the right time. for, And this is a perfect one for Iowa's punter and – you you said something to me, obviously, when we were talking about it, and you said, even a hockey guy knows this. That's <laughs> yeah. terrible. Then the one thing I'll say for your punter, obviously I'll give you congratulations, but at the end of the day, whoopee-doo. I mean, this is just – how did you get 10 wins on the year and make this situation to where you're in this bowl game and you don't – you, you get goose egged by the Vols. I mean, I don't know if I went back and listened to me sing good old Rocky Top, but, I mean, for for this kind of persistence, Iowa, you, you should have just stayed home. And Kirk Ferentz, I'm sorry that we, we had to witness this yet again. And you literally went – you just went 92-0 and 0 against th- the – AP ranked teams. How does well, that make you feel? Here's here's how they won ten games. They beat Utah State. Nobody. They beat Iowa State. Iowa State was kind of garbage this year. They were uh, 50, they, 50 they, coin flip. They did not do well. Uh, let, let's see what their I forget what their overall record was this year. Um, I think it was like it shows that they were seven, seven and six. Five, seven, seven six, and six. Okay. Not a good year. Uh, so, good job you beat Iowa State, I guess. They beat Western Michigan. They lost to Penn State 31-0. to zero. They beat Michigan State, who was a dumpster fire this year. They beat <laughs> yeah, Purdue. They, know what with. they beat Purdue, who was a dumpster fire this year. Mm-hmm. They barely beat Wisconsin, who is just learning to, to fit into their new coach. Mm-hmm. Um, they beat Minnesota. Or no, 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 sorry. They lost to they Minnesota. Lost against Minnesota uh, yeah. I forgot about that one because their punt their punt return got called back. You know what? You deserve it because you should have scored more points on offense. Exactly. Uh, you barely beat Northwestern, who was a dumpster fire, but Northwestern hats off to you because not only did you have a phenomenal season given the circumstance, but you also beat Utah. All of this year was with an interim head coach, but mm-hmm. you beat Northwestern. You beat Rutgers. You beat Illinois, who was on a downslope this year from last year. You beat Nebraska, who is with a new new head coach and also a terrible offense. Uh, they were only ranked like five above uh, Iowa in total offense or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you got blown out by Michigan and now blown out by Tennessee. So you lost to your three ranked opponents. You lost 31-0, 26-0, and 35-0. You figure out what the problem is. Yeah, there's no fixing that that problem. You can't wrap that problem with duct tape and call it good. You you can't even you, you just want to literally just throw it in the trash. It's that just it to me. It's just an absolute epitome and a joke. I mean, uh, all I'm going to say is Iowa. Just stick with Caitlin Clark and let the basketball thing do its thing. So that's all I'm really going to say for Iowa. People are still drinking free draft beer over at that golf place. That doesn't they still surprise me. They still I would. I would be too. <laughs> but, 
So, oh, so let's see for for Iowa too. Let me let me pull that back up because I want to I want to go through this. Let's see. So for Iowa, they played. Um, let's see. So one. Okay. So I guess I guess just the last two games were were uh, no no scores. But no scores. If you go back to Nebraska, I, that that's what it was. I was trying to think of what I was thinking of, but uh, my brother and and my dad were laughing because since they played uh nebraska nebraska has scored just as many touchdowns as iowa and nebraska hasn't played a single game <laughs> oh my god that so that was right that there. was just funny uh because they're nebraska fans so they were they were yeah. kind of loving the fact that iowa sucks uh their offense sucks uh, and obviously your defense isn't good enough to stop uh you know you, they're they're not good enough to stop michigan or tennessee uh, or Penn State for that matter. So, but overall, I'm mean, just looking at these realistically, games, was... Josh. I understand for the Michigan standpoint. I knew they weren't going to get that. Obviously, now going against Tennessee here, I thought they like anybody would. I thought at least they get a field goal or a touchdown. And I would think they could have gotten nine points, maybe or something. fourteen points at the most. And I don't think they scored That's a touchdown general. because they're just that bad. But yeah. man, yeah, I just Iowa figure it out. You've got a lot of figuring out to do in this offseason. You way. should have a new offensive coordinator. Maybe that'll help a little bit. But yeah, stick stick over to the women's hardwood and uh, wrestling. It's about all you've got here in, in Iowa. But that's pretty much all we've got for you guys. We all thank we thank you all so much for all of your love and support. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to hit that like button. You can also hit that subscribe button. That helps us out a lot. And you can share us on social media and follow us on social media. We're on X, uh, formerly known as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all that fun stuff. So go follow us and, and show us some love over there. We've been getting a lot of love over on Instagram. So keep that up. Uh, we, we'd love to hear more from you guys. Uh, and then, of course, you can always join us here on YouTube. Uh, we will be posting every Tuesday and Thursday now that the new year has kicked in. Uh, we're going to have a lot to talk about next Tuesday's episode. Uh, so and make sure to tune in because you will not want to miss that one. That one should be a very fun one. Um, but you know, we've, we've, we've thank everyone so much for all of your support. Of course, if you're watching or if you're listening on Apple podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, make sure to give us a five star review. That is the best way to help us on those platforms. But we thank you all so much for your support. Thank you very much to big frig and factor for, for supporting us here and sponsoring this episode. Um, but that's all we've got for talking about these bowl games, guys. We thank you all and happy new year and we'll catch you next time.